Okay, so difference thresholds. So the difference threshold is the minimum amount of difference needed for you to detect that there is a difference with 50% accuracy. So we could be talking about how much louder one sound needs to be than the other, how much heavier one weight needs to be than the other, um, how much brighter one light needs to be than the other, things like that. Um, it's the minimum amount of difference that needs to exist for you to be able to detect that there actually is a difference with that same 50% accuracy that we talked about with the absolute threshold. That's always our cutoff point between hit and miss. Um, so it pertains to things like color, pitch, weight, temperature, um, brightness, so on. So I'm waiting for, okay. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, so do you, you may or may not have noticed that the slide has been changing in um, color, I guess is the right phrase. I've got a uh, slightly darker plum on the left than on the right. Um, in my classroom, this is really hard to detect because the image is being projected onto a really big screen. And so it's actually really, really uh, subtle on the screen. It's a little more clear here on my laptop. And I don't know how whether your laptop has the same or your computer screen has the same um, you know, resolution that mine does. Those of you who are looking on like a Mac or a, an Apple are probably like, oh, how could anybody not notice that? Um, those of us working on PCs are probably a little less intense. Um, but the idea is that, you know, it's a subtle, a subtle enough difference that you may or may not have noticed the difference, right? Um, and I had it fade, so you now see it's fading out. Weber's law tells us that there's actually a minimum percentage that the two stimuli must differ by in order for us to notice that the two stimuli are different. So, for example, two, uh, two different weights, if you've got two different weights, one in each hand, they'd have to differ by at least 2% for you to notice that one is lighter than the other. Um, light intensity must be at least 8% greater for you to notice that one of the lights is more intense than the other. Um, the sound wave frequency, which is a, you know, um, I can't remember the name of the, mes the um, measure, it's not decibels, it's something else. Um, say the frequency, which measures pitch, it, it needs to be different by three tenths of a percent for you to notice that the two um, tones are different from each other. So when we talk about the two colors, I'm not exactly sure how far they need to be off of each other, you know, in the rainbow for you to notice. But, you know, there's a certain cutoff point for people to be able to notice that, that things have changed. And that's Weber's law. He says it's a percentage. Every stimulus has a specific percentage that it must vary in order for you to notice that it has gotten to be more or less of itself. Um, so, it, and that Weber's law is really an important issue for us in our everyday life because when you go shopping, salespeople may not know the name of Weber's law, but they know the principle and the psychology behind Weber's law. And so what they try and do is once you've committed yourself to a purchase, to a, especially something that's um, a reasonably decent size purchase, um, maybe more than $50, they try and get you to tack on a couple more dollars hoping that it's not enough of a percentage increase in your total purchase for you to notice that you spent more. So if you were to go buy a new suit, let's say, once you've gotten wedded to the suit, it'll be easier for them to upsell you a shirt or a tie or in the case of women, a necklace or a scarf or some, a blouse, something like that. It's easier to upsell less expensive items once you've sold the big ticket item. Because what the idea is, is that you may not notice the overall change in the price overall. You know, you've already spent, I don't know how much a suit costs anymore. <laughs> I don't get out much. Luckily, I teach college, so I don't have to wear suits. Um, but you've already spent, let's say, $100. Uh, maybe it's a suit in 1985, I don't know. But uh, So they upsell a $10 scarf to go with it, and... What's 10% of a hundred? Oh, yeah, you know what? I do need it. I do need that to uh, dress it up. That'll give me a lot more flexibility. So I might as well buy it. That's the kind of thinking that goes into that kind of upsell. 
Now, when buying a suit and, and something small, that's not that big of a deal, but when you're buying something like a car, then suddenly you'll realize they'll start focusing you in on your monthly payment. And they'll say things like, well, if you upgrade to this, it'll only add 25 cents a month to your monthly payment, hoping that you'll it won't be enough of a percentage for you to notice how much they've um, added on to the total cost. Um, so, you know, you buy the car for $10,000. Yeah, I guess it's 1985 in my world, but you buy your $10,000 car and then they upsell um, the undercoating, which is that mysterious thing that I have no idea why, what it is. But And they say it's only $300, but it'll protect your car. Well, when you've already bought a $10,000 car, $300 isn't that much. But even better is to say, okay, your $10,000 car, you're going to be making a $200 a month payment. And this undercoating is only going to cost you $0.25 cents a month. You're like, hmm, does seem worth it. Let's do it. What the heck? Once you've done the undercoating and the clear sealing and the upgraded stereo system and all these things are adding 25 cents per month to the price of your car, next thing you know, you've added three dollars to your payment, which you know still probably won't in the scheme of 200. Really, you may think that's not so bad. It's all it's okay, but it's all stuff that maybe you didn't even really want, and you're just spending extra money. Salespeople know how to use that. Um, good shoppers know how to defend against that. Uh, so you got to be prepared. Make your um, decisions before you go in and, and have sale. Now, on the other hand, um, if you are a salesperson and uh, stuff, make sure you're using your Vapor's Law. <laughs> be a good salesperson. Okay, so hopefully you still have that pen behind your ear. Do you even remember that you have it back there anymore? Um, does it, do you even feel it anymore is the idea? Uh, we adapt to whatever is constant and we st our brain stops processing that constant input. So if you've been sitting with a pencil behind your ear and it hasn't been falling out or, or attracting your attention, but instead just sat there, um, you probably got used to it and you don't notice it anymore. It's really weird because when I'm doing these lectures, I have a, a full-on headset with, uh, with the microphone and things on it. And when I get done lecturing, there have been times when I've tried to just walk away. Um, not remembering that I'm wearing this headset. You get used to whatever stimulation is constant. That's sensory adaptation. Okay, stare at the blue dot for 30 seconds. Most stimulating lecture ever. Oh, I should have jokes prepared for this part. Okay, stare at the blue dot. It's okay to blink your eyes, but don't scan the visual field. Just stare. So... This guy goes into his psychologist's office and he says, I'm a wigwam, I'm a teepee, I'm a wigwam, I'm a teepee. And the psychologist says, relax, you're too tense. <laughs> okay, so the, hopefully now what you're looking at is a blue background with pink birds flying on it, right? Um, this is a type of sensory adaptation that you're experiencing. It's actually um, an after image that you're experiencing and it should be fading off by now. Um, what we've done is we've overstimulated your visual receptors in the pattern of the red background and the, uh, let's go back and just show you there, red background, green birds, so that when the red background, green birds disappeared and all you could see was the white background, you were seeing the after image, the oppositional colors and things. Um, that's your, that's one example of how your sensory system can adapt. So your touch system can adapt and you get used to things that are constantly touching you. Your visual system can adapt for color or um, even for motion. If you're looking at, let's say, a waterfall, like if you ever go, for those of you who live here on the west side, if you go to Snoqualmie Falls and the waterfall is, is rushing past and you pick out a rock to stare at, that's midway down the waterfall and let the water just rush past your visual system. Let that happen for about 30 seconds, then switch your, vis your, um, your gaze to the cliff ne next to it. Uh, an area of the cliff that's the same width as the waterfall will seem to be going up in opposition to what you had been um, looking at. That's your sensory system having adapted. That's your visual system adapting to the motion. You'll notice that in the after image, you saw the opposite of the colors that you had originally seen. In the motion detection, you see the opposite motion of what you had originally seen. 
that's um, one of the functions of sensory adaptation is that, uh, in, in vision at least, is that you have sort of the opposite of what you had been overstimulated with. So uh, vision tends to, to work like that. In um, other things like touch, you'll actually get an, an after image touch where it's literally like you feel like you're still being touched. So it's not exactly the same in all the different sensory organs. Um, but you get used to whatever you've been over experiencing. Okay, now part of what I mentioned in the definition of perception is that you can impose top-down processing on what you're experiencing. So whereas sensation brings information up through your sense organs and you just process, you know, you're just collecting information, in perception you're going to impose meaning. So in perceptual set we're talking about how we, we perceive what we expect to see. Um, so this is a type of top-down processing like I mentioned. Now when I was a, a kid I was led to believe that that was the Loch Ness Monster. Uh, there was this TV show called In Search Of hosted by Leonard Nimoy from the original Star Trek show and he, uh, you know, it was a 30 minute show and, and it was like back in the olden days when we didn't have cable and stuff like that, you know, if something was on ABC or whatever, you kind of felt like it had some legitimacy to it. And he, so he had his little show called In Search Of and they kind of, it's sort of equivalent to what you might see on H2 these days. And, uh, you know, he had an interview with the guy who took the picture supposedly and he swore up and down what he saw and everything. It's all very convincing, especially, you know, I was like 10 years old when I saw the interview. Um, so I, when I saw that this image, it just absolutely, I knew that was Loch, Loch Ness Monster, no question. Later, it was debunked, and the guy finally admitted it was a tree branch. Uh, but our expectation clouds what we perceive. So knowing the story behind it, I think it's the Loch Ness Monster, right? Um, people who believe in flying saucers are more likely to see these kinds of cloud formations as flying saucers when in fact they're clouds. We, this, hap this kind of cloud happened um, over Tacoma and a bunch of people called the Air Force Base and we're saying, you know, what is that? And it's, it's a particular kind of really dense cloud that then gets wind shear that goes around the edges of it. And it does look pretty freaky at first, right? And of course you know how clouds blow and so they move and it's, they, they do look pretty convincingly like flying saucers, especially if you have a perceptual set that leads you to believe that it's possible that you'll see flying saucers, right? Um, so perceptual set affects what we perceive because it's what you expect to see. The word set literally means expectation. So you're sort of expecting to perceive certain things when we're talking about perceptual set. Context affects your perceptions. So the dot in the middle is the same size in both sides, in both panels, but the one on the right looks bigger than the one on the left, right? Um, the, the circles that are around the inner circle are providing context that allow us to judge the size of the inner circle. So the one on the, the, circ the uh, context circles being bigger than the center circle on the left make the center circle seem smaller and the circles being smaller on the right than the center circle makes the center circle seem bigger um, when they're in fact, in fact the same size. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about how our visual system works. And this helps to understand um, that after image and why you saw the opposite colors and stuff. Okay, so you see the white light entering the prism and then it breaks, the prism breaks the white light into the visible spectrum. And you'll notice that the visible spectrum is just a, a narrow band of all the different light waves that are out in the, out in the world. Um, the visible spectrum is the full rainbow of colors that we can perceive, right? So white light is made up of all the colors of the rainbow. And for you to perceive light as white, like the background part of this slide, the, your ability to, per, to perceive that as white or to detect that as white relies on all of your color receptors in your eyes firing at the same rate so that you'll detect that white, the, the background of this slide as white. Uh, the parts of, this, of the slide that are blue are um, absorbing all the other colors of the rainbow and only allowing your eyes to pull out the blue part. That's how the visible spectrum works with our eyes. Um, now 
the light waves come to us as waves, obviously. So we have two properties of light waves that are interesting. One is how tall the waves are. Um, and the other one is how long the waves are. Um, this slide refers to how long the waves are. So the bluish color is really represented by a shorter wavelength. These are called higher frequency waves because the distance between the peaks of the light waves is a lot shorter than in the reddish colors, which has the longer wavelength. Now if we go back to our rainbow, blue is on one end and red is on the other. And you'll notice there are numbers listed along the rainbow. That's talking about the frequency of the light waves. So the um, shorter frequency light waves are going to produce the bluer colors and the longer wavelengths are going to produce the redder colors. Now the height of the wave determines how bright the color is, how intense the color is. So when you have a higher amplitude wave, it produces a brighter color or a more intense color. A shorter amplitude wave is going to produce duller, less saturated colors. So the top color might be, you know, neon or might be, you know, deep cranberry red, you know, on the bottom you're going to have more like grays and, you know, heather, you know, those kinds of colors. So um, light waves determine how bright and what shade the um, light our eyes detect will be. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and stop right here and we'll come back and we'll walk our way through the structure of the eyeball.